Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of The Art of the Mating. This week we have Byron Rogers of Performance Genetics, one of the most insightful commentators of our chosen topic. And this is a biggie. Are machines taking over horse racing? Well, I don't know if you've been living under a stone, but AI has been on the forefront of the tech innovation world forever. But this week and this month, we seem to be hitting an inflection point, a moment which I think we'll look back in history and think of the moment when ChatGBT came out and how this dialogue system, which you, this uh, program which you can speak to, can give you so much insight, like a co-pilot to your daily life. I think horse racing is going to be hit, maybe not next week, maybe not this year, but soon... This will be the future of how we approach our game. Of course, imperative to everything, and I think an exciting aspect to racing, if we think we're going to be replaced, horsemanship will always be paramount and of the ultimate importance when it comes to our sport. But we need to be aware of the tools that are out there, and we need to understand how we can use them to our advantage. So that's why I wanted to bring Byron on for this chat to discuss exactly that. I hope you enjoy it. I hope if you haven't already, that you wouldn't mind just hitting that subscribe button below and hitting like on this video. It just helps us spread the word of what we're trying to do, which is give an alternative type of content when it comes to horse racing. So much of what we see is gambling based, which I think is a great thing and I love a bet myself, but I think there should be more about the intricacies of our great game. If you want to buy a share in one of our horses, and indeed, if you want to buy a breezer with us this year, head to syndicate.racing. You can use the code Art of the Mating for 50 euro off. What a great deal that is. Okay, enough from me. Let's hear this fascinating chat with myself and Byron. Byron, performing genetics, the, I, I read Trainer Magazine this morning, Byron, they described you as the godfather of biomechanics in the thoroughbred industry. I hope this chat is going to go well enough. I don't wake up tomorrow morning with a uh, uh, head beside my uh, my bed. But uh, let's let's fingers crossed for that. Uh, thanks very much for joining us and have a, having a chat about how machines could be taking over the sport of horse racing. A produ- provocative title, but no better man to discuss it than you, Byron. Uh, starting off, I just the first thing to talk about is the success of. Um, yourself and your partnership with star bloodstock buying these uh breeze up horses uh of, on the racetrack uh no both in the sales ring and on the racetrack we think of malabat which of course was bought by Mo- moigler stud so recently um a- after her graduating from the star bloodstock um uh, team we have Ali who has his first foals on the ground again a star bloodstock graduate your relationship with star bloodstock your success in recent years Give us the um, well, yeah, thank, well, like a lot, to, a lot to unpack there. But uh, look, I think the you know the, the main thing about about us at Star Blastock is is you know we do use a lot of data to do what we do. And Matt Eves, who's the actual you know business partner in in Star Bloodstock, um, you know when he first came to me, you know, it'll be seven or eight years ago now, and sort of said, "Hey, can you, you know, we can we start looking at buying breeze up horses?" And he was he was already doing breeze up horses um, at the time. You know, I took a very analytic, I take a very analytic approach to, to the way, um, we do, you know, select horses. Um, and we, you know, each year we're trying to build data and, and try to, try to get that a little bit better. Um, and so, yeah, so the racetrack results have been good. Um, and every year we just sort of try to, try to get a little bit better. So right now, um, you know, it's sort of like a, a football coach. You know, you have your team playing your football today and, and, and they're getting ready to play. You know, we're, we're about to go into the breeze-up season and they're about to, you know, play in their finals, so to speak. But we're also at the same time looking at how do we get our next team uh, next year um, into a better shape and make sure that, you know, for next year going forward, we have, a, we have a better selection process and we get better results and we're always trying to incrementally get better and... and um, so we always say to, to, to do that, we do use a lot of data and we sort of look at it from an analytical viewpoint and try to, um, you know, think about, uh, you know, the horse sales aren't, there's no, like there's a start and a finish, but you've actually got to treat every horse at a yearling sale or at all yearling sales as an equivalent. Um, and that's been the biggest change for a challenge for me um, and for, I think, for every bloodstock agent or any trainer or anything like that is that, 
is that if you start at the first, say, European yearling sale at Arcana in, in August, is taking that sale and treating the first horse that goes through the ring there the same as the last horse that goes through Tats in December and having a very, um, you know, methodical approach to it and not just sort of buying them because they're there in front of you and, and that's, that's, um, and you're at the sale type of thing. We've, so, um, that's been the challenge for us is to try to build up systems and build up things that, that allow us to sort of do that sort of thing. And, and the, 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 the byproduct of that is obviously the horses that we then take through at, at the breeze up sales. Um, and so we've got a continual feedback loop of, of information and, and, um, you know, the one of the challenges is as breeze up consigners, uh, that star blood stock and as I find buying for, um, star blood stock, there, there are probably two real, real challenges. One is we do see a lot of horses that, um, at the yearling sales that we'd never subject to a breeze up. Um, and so people get very, you know, uh, there's a, there's a group of thinking that, oh, you're breeze up guys, you, you know, you do, you know, force horses to do things that they shouldn't do. And that's actually so far wrong. It's not even funny. Um, most of the guys that, that, you know, work in the industry and that are good at what they're doing are trying to find horses that actually fit the breeze up program. Um, you know, they had a great year, you know, last, as you say, with Malabath, we've had a great year, but also like, you know, Native Trail and Cache and Eldar Eldarov, you've got three classic winners coming out of Breeze Up Sales in, 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 in the last uh, 24 months. Um, and, you know, horses like Lazoo and, and the Platinum Queen and uh, uh, those sorts of horses, and even a horse like Trushan, who's a, who's obviously a long, long distance horse. The Breeze Up guys have done a great job, but, but, None of us go to a sale thinking to ourselves, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to have a look at that horse and try to buy that horse. And if we see a big backward, you know, horse, it's going to be a four year old. We just don't even, they don't even try to do that. So that's the first misconception I think about breeze up guys is, is that we go to a sale and we see a lot of horses we really like, but we say, I wouldn't subject that horse to what we've got to ask it to do. I just wouldn't do it. That's a nice horse. Someone else should be training that horse. Um, the second part that's got, you know, really hard. Uh, if you talk about what's hard for, for Breeze Up guys is is how the guys that are buying the Breeze Up horses have how sophisticated they've got. Um, that's been that's been the hard thing for us, uh, me especially over the last decade, is to see um, guys like Richard Brown at, at, at Blanford, um, the guys like at, at Godolf and Jason Hathorne and his team. Um, that do some work for various people, um, uh, the good often guys, the, the guys that, um, uh, you know, David Reb is in their group. They've got very, very good, um, at finding horses. Um, and if you go back and sort of look at, you know, the, the genesis of like, they started putting up timing gates, timing gates were just, you know, you know, when I started that they, they'd already had timing gates. I think Patrick Veach is a, you know, uh, you'd all probably know, um, him and um, um, what's his name, uh, Stuart uh, Williams, and actually David Redvers, they were the first ones to put up timing gates and start to time the horses. Um, and that's then sort of moved on to, okay, guys, we're looking for a fast time. And so we, you know, all the Breeze Up guys started to really sort of, you know, get the horses fit and have them work that two furlongs very quickly. Um, that sort of changed a little bit more, uh, more recently, uh, you know, us as breeze up consigners start to think about gallop out, you know, how does a horse gallop out and whether it's, you know, having a stronger second half of its breeze is stronger than the first half of its breeze. Um, so we all started to really sort of look for gallop outs and try to make a, make a horse really gallop out well, because it, the indication was that, that that's what they were looking for. They were looking for a horse that could sustain a good gallop out. Well, a lot of guys were sort of, you know, holding them at the start, they were off the pole at the start. They weren't going sort of flat out from the start. They were trying to build up to a, to a nice um, breeze along the way. Um, and more recently, that's changed again. Like that's what's you know, really hard is that is that that, that... It's an effort. Yeah, the, 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 as you say, the, the end, it, it, it just changes and the end user, the buyer, is the one that's driving, driving the change. Um, and I can sort of like, so this you know, is this is our video. Norm Williamson's horse, the horse that won the um, uh, the Guineas Native Trail. Um, this is his uh, breeze. This is Mickey Clear, who's also a consigner uh, up on board. Um, I'll just press play here and just let it roll forward. So if you're watching the um, breeze here, there's the set of gates there. That's the that's the first. This is the two furlong pole. That's the set of gates here. 
traditionally there used to just be one set of gates and everyone just be like, you know, and, and a lot of guys are still on one set of gates. So they're just looking at what time that horse goes through. But actually, if you see here, you see this second set of gates that's just over this side here. What they're actually started doing now mm -hmm. is looking at the velocity. So if you know the distance between that, the first set of gates and the second set of gates, you say that's a distance. You know, and Then you know the time that that horse has walked across that distance. You're actually getting the entrance velocity. How fast is that go horse going at that point in time? Um, you can't get that off a single gate unless that single gate, unless you sort of had a speed camera there or something like that. So what these guys are doing is they're looking at velocity there and then they've got another set of gates further up, um, up near the, the uh, one furlong pole. You'll see it there. there. There's the set of gates there, but there's the, there's the velocity pole there. Mm -hmm. And they have the same thing at the finish. So what they're actually doing is measuring not just the raw time or looking for a horse that goes fast. What they're looking at is the variation of velocity. Um, so what they're trying to do is get a horse that doesn't just go fast, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't vary its velocity at along the, along the whole gallop. And they're also looking at the same thing with stride parameters. So they're looking at, you know, how long is this horse's stride and is it keeping maintaining that sort of stride length and stride frequency at the whole gallop. So it, it, it really does take out, um, Horses that aren't, you know, have got high variation in their velocity aren't usually very good horses. Um, and I'll give you a show, show you a couple of examples here. If I've got um, one of the great, you know, things that's happened in, in the horse racing industry is the data you're getting off, like play, total performance data and, and, and um, that you're getting at sales. So here's a, um, here's a good example of it. This is um, just a tweet that they did here with Highfield Princess at Deauville when she won the Group 1 race. So she held her speed within 5% of her top speed for 45 seconds of the race, which is more than anyone else in the field. So when we start talking about breeze-up sales, now what they're looking for is not just your raw speed, but have you held that raw speed or close to that raw speed for the whole period of the breeze? So instead of just you know looking at it in, in isolation, saying this horse went fast, well, the horse could go fast because we have a really just a quick peek and just go all of a sudden you have a really high maximum speed. But what they're actually now looking for is that speed distributed over the whole two furlong breeze. Um, so it's That's fascinating because when we watch races, right, and we think about brilliant horses, you know, the horses that win group ones, frequently what we talk about, mm. like Highfield Princess, is her turn of foot. Um, and actually what is in reality happening is the other horses are not being able to maintain their top speed and she is maintaining yeah. that speed throughout. And what visually that gives you an impression of a turn of foot, but in fact, it's just she's able to stay on the treadmill. Yeah, as, as a percentage of the race, comparative horse. to all other horses in the race, yeah. Um, you know, obviously, you know, and if we, there's other horses we can look at, like if you look at uh, this horse here, um, Bay Bridge, who won, you know, he won the, the, um, the, the group one race there at, at, at Ascot. Um, it's the same thing. Like he holds its peak speed. How long can you hold? If you've got, you know, it's not your, your peak speed is, is obviously your stride length by your stride frequency. So how, how, how long is your stride and how many times you're turning it over? Um, is your peak speed. But if you're holding that for a long period of time relative to all the other horses in the race, you end up winning the race. Um, and that's what, um, you know, is really quite interesting because if you go back and look at, say, um, you know, if you go back, I'll just show you something here on the, um, like a horse like Art Power, say, for example, here. Um, total performance data do all the races, and they give you the, the stride length and stride frequency of the horse. Art Power is a good horse, but his stride length is basically 24 feet. His stride frequency is about 2.45 strides per second. Um, that's very average. Like in, in terms of if you're looking at a, a whole bunch of horses, you'd see that every day. You'd see that every day. But what he can do, what separates out him from every other horse that has the same stride parameters as him is the, the, his ability to keep that up like, a, like we sort of looked at with, with, um, with uh, Highfield Princess is keeping that up to a, a um, within 5% of that top of that, of those, those metrics for the longest period in a race. Um, and that's what, separates out the good horse from the bad horse it's not it's not necessarily a stride parameter in terms of stride length or stride frequency 
Um, you do get those outliers, like, you know, Black Caviar had a really long stride and she could turn it over at, at a high speed. So she had a, she had an extraordinary high peak, uh, acceleration. Um, but she again was able to hold that for that longer period of time in a race. And because she had both, she had a really high, high peak acceleration and she could hold it for a long period of time. That, that then became made the reason why she's, you know, um, was unbeatable. Um, and the same thing with, say, a horse like Frankel. You know, he had a really long stride and could hold that really long stride and that, high, and he had a high frequency relative to his stride length. Cause there's an, there's an inverse correlation, generally speaking. Um, these horses here that have, you know, low stride frequencies, the horses have got like 2.25 strides per second. You know, they're basically 10, 12 furlong horses. They have long strides on them. They'll have, you know, 25, 26 meter, 26 feet, I should say, 26 feet stride lengths. Um, but they can't turn it over fast. Um, you get the outlier, like a black caviar or a, or a Frankel who has both, who has a long stride and has a higher frequency and they're just deadly, but they're very hard to find. Yeah. You, can, you, you go, you go blind trying to find those horses all the time. So, um, and it's very interesting to hear from the buying perspective. And of course, the, the beauty of the breeze ups, right? Is you see a horse gallop, but. When you are picking these horses that to perform that act of a gallop over two furlongs, you do so over a 20 meter walk in front of you and a 20 meter walk back. And you need to project onto that horse what that horse might do when it comes to the athletic act that we are asking for them for. We're not buying them to win walking races. Yeah. We're buying them to win gallops. How, do you, how does that correlate from just the sheer act of walking to what an elite that is the um, twenty sixty four thousand dollar question. Uh, <laughs> um, so there is some some correlations of stuff, and that's what um, I'm. You know, we talked about earlier on as to as to what what you're sort of trying to we're trying to develop and what trying to trying to do. There are um, uh, we do obviously look at a horse the way it walks, and we've got data on um, you know lots of horses in terms of. Uh, how they walk, and we we deconstruct it using a, a a program called Deep Lab Cut that does markless biomechanics, and we've got a, got various models that um, we can I can show you some some of the um, output of. Let me just see if I can get this in sort of some sort of shape. Um, uh, let's see here. So um, we've done heaps of models, heaps of different models, and and um, uh, you know. When we do stuff like we looked at cardios and we've looked at DNA as well and stuff like that, and when we've done that, the most interesting aspect of it all is that biomechanics, the way the horse moves and the way the horse is conformed is the highest, hot, most important feature. Um, so we've done cardios as well. Um, we've done DNA markers. We've looked at DNA markers. We've thrown a whole bunch of stuff into different models. And when you actually do the models, um, the way the horse walks and the way the horse stands up and the conformation, that is actually, that's a physical manifestation of its genetics anyway. So what you're trying to do is capture the variable that, that explains the, the largest variance in the horses. So what we found is, and this is years of, you know, looking at it and making mistakes and, and, and doing a whole lot of different stuff is that basically the way the horse walks can, can, um, overcome a lot of things in terms of like you can have a slightly inefficient cardio what we did deem is just not a very good cardio but if you're a very efficient walker and therefore or, or i should say a very efficient mover on the racetrack um your inefficiencies in the cardiovascular um uh, parameters aren't as important because you're efficiently using oxygen um so if you've got a horse that's really good mover it overcomes a lot of the issues that you see sort of see with um uh with cardiovascular capacity and a lot of the DNA markers, which you'll see down here, all these DNA markers are, are, are sort of down low on the totem pole of things that, that actually um, matter. Um, like these class rate, these ones here are all DNA markers down the bottom. The reason they're down there is that basically these sorts of larger um, descriptive uh, variables of the horse explain more. Um, so then we, when we sort of look at... Uh, Biomechanics, you know, we separate out horses. We basically come out with probabilities of, of things occurring. Um, 
uh, and we just we have our own rating scale, which is just a, so these horses are all sort of given a rating. These are horses, so there's eight thousand two hundred twenty three horses that we've have racing outcomes on, and that's actually quite an important thing to sort of understand. When you go to a yearling sale, this is what gets you is if you look at a thousand yearlings uh, at a yearling sale, um, for every thousand yearlings that you look at, almost 400 of them, well, a little bit less than 400, never never go to the racetrack or never have three or more starts, which you need at least to have three starts to work out if the horse has got any level of ability. So if you're look, you go to a yearling sale, Jack, and you're looking at a bunch of yearlings, almost 40%, four out of every 10 that you're looking at, give you no information. So, so it, make, it becomes a really hard thing to learn. You've got to discard those. You don't know what they are because it's not two or three years later that we know the outcome. But you've got to discard those in your brain and say, I don't, we don't need those. And this is where sort of getting databases of information is sort of really sort of helpful. Um, but we get to a situation now where... Um, you know, we start to look at all these horses and we give them ratings and stuff like that. And, and this is bi- this is just our biomechanics, just as based on the horse, horses walking and, and the way it walks. And we try to put them into groups. And, you know, and we're trying to buy these horses that are in these top groups, A's and A plus uh, ratings, because the odds ratio uh, is up is, is for you in, the, in this department. Like, it doesn't mean that if a horse that we rate as a D, there's still good horses in there. There's still, you know, 4% of all D horses are still, what we rate poorly, are still turning out to be nice horses. But when you start to talk about these groups here, um, you know, when almost half of them are turning out to be elite runners, then that's what you're trying to buy. It's all just probabilities about trying to buy um, horses with the highest probability of turning out to be a good horse. So um, you asked me about earlier on about, uh, before we started talking about a horse, um, our breeze up horses and um like if we just uh uh what's his name this is the horse we do like a bit um at the site at uh that's coming into the sales um i think that's him isn't it is that the horse maybe 20 is he uh yeah, it might take a second here to just come up give me a second. yeah there he is there um so he comes up really well for us. Like he, we really like this horse as a horse. So we went and bought him. That's a he's a um, I see the stars colt at the sales, um, and he looks like he's he looks like he's got above average ability. So we'd be you know looking at him. Um, that's the sort of way we're looking at horses now. We're sort of sort of using video, um, using these big data models with you know eight eight ten, you know ten thousand horses with racing outcomes that we know what's going on. And, and starting to really just hone down on, um, you know, what uh, the horses that we think have got the better way of going and the better way of moving that, that's more um, frequently seen in, in elite race horses. Um, and when I think about it, when you think about the walk, right, so when I go look at a horse, I will write down on my catalogue page one of three things, hmm. poor walk, okay walk, good walk, right? And... Good walk for me, my thesis on a good walk is a fluidity a, uh, a and a effortlessness and a power that they move well. It's like watching Usain Bolt, uh, you know, walk well. When you have ran the data, is what the, hu- and I for a lot of people, I think they would, uh, you know, that look at horse flesh on a uh, frequent basis and are trying to find good racehorses would say a similar thesis to what a good walk is. Does the data correlate that a good walk is 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 what we would deem a good walk? Because sometimes when I look at horses that are scoring huge mm. numbers on platforms like this, they don't necessarily, to my eye, have a big walk. Is, is, or, or how would you describe what a data? Yeah, I, that's a, it's an interesting like question, this? and and um. I had an interesting conversation about this with with I've had a few one with um, uh, Aidan O'Brien and another with his son Joseph about this and 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 we've sort of been back and forwards about talking about it and, and Aidan O'Brien likes a horse who extends from its shoulder and I asked him about it and I sort of said oh you know why why do you why do you like that sort of why do you like that sort of horse and he said. Um, 
it I find them sounder. He finds the horse that comes out of its shoulder and really uses its shoulder. So there's sort of three or four. There's four ways of walking. Basically, the horses that really extend out of their shoulder and don't collect themselves from behind. They sort of you know only have a fair extension through this through this hind leg and and and, and collect themselves underneath. You know, there's the horses that um, extend really well out of the shoulder. There's the horses that extend really uh, that collect themselves really well from behind, but don't extend from the shoulder. Um, there's the horses that do both that have a really sort of um, extravagant walk in terms of they use their shoulder um, and they collect themselves from behind at the same time. Um, some of that has to do with with um, stride frequency. The horses that do both, the horses with it that really sort of move out from the shoulder and collect themselves from behind, tend to have long strides but low frequency. It's just a tendency. It's not a not an absolute. So we sort of like they tend to be stayers. Uh, so I think there's something to, um, you know, people sort of saying, oh, they want to, you know, they want to buy a stayer and it's got a lovely loose walk. Um, the, the problem with that is that we also see that that loose walk in national hunt horses that end up being hurdlers. Um, so it's sort of, you know, there's a little bit of a, um, and then in terms of like, obviously you don't want the, the first thing, which is they do not extend from the shoulder and they do not do not collect themselves from behind. They end up just being bad horses and also they end up being unsound horses. So um, there's a kernel of truth to what Aidan O'Brien said in terms of, you know, you have to have some fluidity from the front. Um, in terms of sprinters, um, collecting themselves from behind is actually more the, the hind leg and the height, the way the hind leg works in terms of sprinters is more important than actually extending from the front. So sprinters, you don't need them to actually walk as well in front as you, and, and that's the biggest problem with looking at horses. And this is why we use a lot of machine learning, a lot of, lot of data driven, a lot of, lot of artificial intelligence to, to get our heads around this is because it's really hard to look at the two spaces at once. If you're looking at the horse walking, you're right. It's hard to concentrate on both the front of the horse and the, and the rear end of the horse because at the same time, because simultaneously they're both trying to give you data and so it's a really hard thing to concentrate on um and it's why you know um you know one of the reasons why it's very hard to consistently pick out horses is a there's a lot of different types of horses so there's sprinters there's long distance horses there's there's horses over you know the early two-year-olds and there's long distance horses but um late maturing horses but B is that the signal that's actually being given to you in terms of how they're walking and, and its correlation to racehorse performance on the track is simultaneous. So you've actually got to be judging two things at once and that's very hard for you to visually see and to pick it up. Um, so a lot of the, the, the data that we get back from when we use sort of things like Deep Lab Cut where we're putting markerless data on the, on, the, on the horse and we're sort of generating information is that, the 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 signal is simultaneous so the signal that you get from the horse walking actually occurs at the same time that the pot that that but they're in two different spots so there's sort of like the signal from the way that the whole neck and shoulder and 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 works in terms of how it extends out from the front and there's signal from the stuff that occurs in the hind leg and how how far you know relatively speaking how how far uh, how big the um the hind cannon long long the hind cannon is and the tibia uh, are relative to one another. So there's a lot of signal that goes on. Um, it's just very hard for the human eye to pick it up, which is why we sort of look at, you know, using um, data like this to sort of uh, come out with models that sort of can sort of say, okay, this is this is what, um, you know, these get yourself in looking to these sort of types of horses. And I do find that Jack, as, uh, you know, as you do, you write down notes and you start to think about horses. When you start to feed it into the database, and the database sort of start, and the the machine learning algorithm sort of starts to come back and say, "Hey, you should concentrate on these horses more." Um, you start to sort of train your eye to do that anyway, so you start to sort of like see a lot of things that you didn't really take notice of before. And you start, you, it, it, um, it's very, from my perspective, it's very good from for me to continually learn how to look at horses in a in a better light and try to open up myself. I'm a very sprint orientated person. I come from Australia. Um, I like sprinters, but now it's sort of the using this data, it's sort of opened me up to buying, you know, more mileage. Uh, I won't be doing that for you. <laughs>
I, I said I once, I once told uh, Eddie O'Leary, I said, it's a life goal of mine to never have a horse I buy turn up in Gigginstown colours in any race. It's, uh, <laughs> it's not... <laughs> Don't worry, Eddie. Don't worry. I'll still tell you one. Don't worry. I'll send that gap in the market. Um, when I when I poke uh, Matt into the in the ribs and I say, Matt, I have a horse for you. You should come look at it. Invariably, when he's thinking about our draft, um, yeah. we like older mares, and we 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 myself and you, uh, Byron, you and I enjoy a back to forth on this. And he will say things like, to me, it didn't make the list because uh, Byron yeah. scored the yeah. pedigree. Yeah. yeah. In a certain manner, right? What, what? How does pedigree overlay before you've even looked at the horse? What? what so, pedigree, um, pedigree's role for you? We've got a couple of models there, and 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 one of the things that that um, you know, as I said to you earlier on, is to try to get a consistency of looking at horses over you know um, uh, all sales. Try to start it or start at Arcana and finish at Tats in December, and look at every like you know evaluate every horse and that doesn't mean we physically look at every horse it just means evaluate every horse you know a lot of the data models that we've done in terms of pedigree um are related to sort of performance um aspects of of the immediate ancestors and that's what um you know a lot of people don't quite get in terms of um their uh when they're looking at pedigrees um let's see where is pedigree down here somewhere um the immediate ancestors, the sire and the dam, and not a lot of the genetics gets passed. Like, basically, you are what you are in terms of I don't look much further than the second generation um, because anything that's happening back here, it with the way genes work in terms of recombination of genes every generation, it's, it's a sort of a shuffle of the genes, for want of a better word, is that you can't make it have something that's not there. It's sort of like it... Um, uh, the physical type you're seeing in front of you is basically a manifestation of the parents and the grandparents, and 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 it doesn't for me. So a lot of our stuff on on this is, um, you know, we like to look at the race performance of um, the first dam in terms of like this unraced unraced for me is is I, I I use that as saying evidence of nothing. So an unraced mare, I'll look at every foal out of an unraced mare. Um, it doesn't that doesn't concern me being um you know like a an older mare or stuff like that so so this is, a, this is a good example because she's a sister to a good horse so sisters to good horses tend to actually produce good horses for whatever reason they they you know that might be that she's unraced because she had some sort of thing a, a reason for being unraced but funnily enough sisters to good horses end up being uh, good producers as well um and you can see here she's had two two full sisters and they both produced two good horses. Um, this sort of, um, you know, in terms of age of the mare, so age of the stallion and age of the mare, as stallions age and as, as mares age, there's just uh, the probabilities of it being, unless it's a repeat mating of a good horse, they're the one exceptions we come back and look at. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely include, in a, uh, includes repeat matings. Um so if you get a, 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 a an older mare and it's a full brother or full sister to a previously good horse, um, they, they would still make the cut for us in terms of. But we do a lot of um, data analytics in terms of um, you know using simulation of of outcomes, and and that's what we found is basically when you once you start to get to older stallions and older mares, your probabilities of 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 things being good end up uh, end up being quite reduced. So. Everything in our, you know, every sale we go to, everything gets a, a sort of a pedigree rating. I'll still look at a lot of horses. I still like because I like looking at a lot of horses, but I'll still go through. Um, and, uh, you know, if I, if I'm not physically there, and that's what we're trying to build now is this, is this, and I'll show you the last thing that we're working on right now, just to sort of tie it all in, um, is that, you know, we need to get a system in place where the, where, you know, you, if I'm not physically able to make the sale, like people say, Oh, why didn't you buy? Um, I had an interesting conversation actually. Uh, what's his name at Kilman foil? Uh, Mick Fitz gave me grief there. Uh, last year at the sales, he said, you never, he said, what were you doing when, when, uh, that nice wooden bass that I had that Al Refo, the, the horse of Joseph's, he said, what were you doing when that Al, why didn't you buy him? He was, he was in your price range. He's a, he, you know, lovely horse, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, I don't know. And 
I said, well, I worked out as I wasn't even at the sale. So <laughs> I never saw the horse. So I never saw the horse. So, and the same with this horse, same with, with uh, this horse. I, I, he, he, I never saw him um, as a yearling. So you've got we've got to be building systems now where um, I've got to take myself not so much out of the picture, but also allow allow a greater volume of horses to be looked at and, and analysed and get through and and get ourselves into a situation of being able to sort of cover more ground, go to more sales and cover more ground. So um, because good horses come from you know any sale really um, is you know the best horse. That, that, that I remember a great example is is. Um, What's his name? That that horse of Archie Watson's the the thing that won the Norfolk this year. Um, Brad Sell. Brad. Brad Sell. Oh, Brad Sell yeah, sorry. Brad Sell the like he was a gorgeous. Like I loved him as a yearling, but I'd never I'd never gone I'd never gone to the Somerville sale before. Um, your man at um, uh, uh, at Tattersall's, uh, Harvey begged me. He said, "Come to the, come to the Somerville sale." He said, "You'll find something." Blah blah. blah. I went to the Somerville sale. I really liked him as a yearling, um, but couldn't get him to pass a vet at the yearling sales. I remember the guys, you know, uh, the guys that veteran for us, okay. for us said, it's not if this horse has a problem, it's just when it happens. And so we were doing breeze ups and, and he went through the breeze up sale and, and, um, and, uh, Mark Grant had him and he was a breeze up horse and his metrics actually, when you talk, we talk about this whole thing with, with, um, you know, maintain, maintaining stride frequency and stride length and maintaining velocity. Brad Sell's numbers, by all accounts, were just off the charts good. Like he was just so far ahead of everything. At that, he was up at Doncaster. He was a mile ahead of everything, but, but nobody could get him to pass the vets. And fair play to Tom Biggs and and Archie Watson for taking you know. But I think if you if you think about the vets, the vets were probably right. They just said basically it's not if this horse has a problem, it's when he has a problem. And he has had a problem. Um, so, but you get a horse like him at Somerville. Like, so every sale, like, you know, you can get a good horse at every sale. And the best horse at any individual sale is usually better than, like, Brad Sell's a way better horse than, you know, 95%, 98% of the horses that have gone through book two at Tattersall's. So, you know, you've got to be, we've got to be going to every sale. And, um the last sort of piece of the puzzle, and we, we sort of talked about, you know, you, you mentioned this about like how how are you measuring, getting to getting this whole thing of measuring speed and measuring, um, you know, stride length and stride frequency. We, obviously, if you time stride length and stride frequency, you get speed. How are we sort of getting to that? And um, one of the things we're working on is this sort of like biomechanics of measuring um distances and 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 uh, angles and all sorts of things on on the horse and and using photogrammetry which is another method of of um of, of doing it um so what we were trying to now combine is how the horse walks which we talked about earlier on and with how the horse stands up and and the angles and the and the body shapes and there's an interesting I've just run this is like literally I've only just sort of working my way through this model right now I've, I've still I've got about another 9,000 records that I've got to get in and, and, and analyze, but we've just done the first sort of run of this tabular model. We use Google's um, auto ML, which is vertex AI. We use that, but what I found, and this model like 0.78 is not quite good enough. It needs to, like I need to do more feature engineering to try to get it above 0.85 or something like that. So, but it does give you the feature importance. It does tell you what, when it runs through the first and it, and it looks at all the data and it sort of like, tells you like it goes through all the data and weights it all and sort of says okay yeah what's really important and it's actually quite interesting how these characteristics as the horse stands up these are the characteristics which are the most important one is proportion which is so, so that's like how yeah so, that, horse is. so if you think about the horse it's well, most thoroughbreds almost all thoroughbreds are longer than they are taller um, but it's by how much they're longer than, than they are taller. It's actually the important part is you're looking at the proportion. So I buy, like if I buy a sprinter, a lot of the things that people I f I'm now finding as I go back and look at the data and start keep learning off of it is that I don't buy enough proportion. I don't buy enough body length to the height. Um, I, I actually, and by doing it, by having thinking, oh, you know, I've got a lovely sh short sprint, sprinting back and all that sort of carry on is 
you end up compromising stride length because these horses don't have enough don't have enough scope to pull out a good a good stride length, um, and so therefore they have to be high turnover horses. And with the one to one coupling between horses have to breathe every time they they take a take a take a stride. So if you've got a short striding horse, he's doing a high turnover. They they're actually end up you know taking breaths all the time and having to you think that's a good thing, but actually they're going to oxygen debt faster. So. Um, it's actually a bad thing. So that was interesting. Like when, as I say, I'm learned, this is, I literally did this model like a week ago, 10 days ago. So I'm, I'm, I'm starting to sort of get, you know, more of the information in and sort of start to, um, but definitely proportion in terms of body length relative to height is important. Um, the other thing was the hind cannon, which, which is an interesting one. So the hind cannon from here to here, um, a lot of that's to do with leverage. Like if you think about the hind leg of a horse is where all of the power comes from. Um, so a longer hind cannon uh, relative to the overall size of the horse gives you gives the horse leverage. So you don't want a short hind cannon. And I think the third one there is this triangle, which is um, – so the triangle is uh, the distance of this, the hip or the, 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 the pelvic bone here, the femur running down here, and the tibia, which runs from here to here, um, they've got to be fairly even. Um, and that's, a hard, again, a hard thing for people to physically look at when they're looking at a horse is the more even they are, um, the better the racehorse, the better I think that it, I've got to do some more research on this, but I think they're better off ma at managing fatigue if, they're, if they're, they're fairly even between these three measurements in between the hip length and their, and their uh, tibia. So this tibia... Um, but it's 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 very individualistic in terms of if you've got a a a, a a a tibia that's slightly short, but you've got a really long hind cannon, you have a tremendous kick on a on a turf horse, especially like they can they can really sort of kick and maintain it, but they can't maintain a a good you know that strike like so what we talked about with Highfield Princess, they can't if they've got a short if they've got a short tibia and a and a long hind cannon. They can't maintain that for, they've got a very high peak speed, but they can't maintain it for a long period of time. Um, you see this a lot. This is an Australian horse and you see this a lot with Australian horses. They'll have these short tibias and, and long hind cannons. Um, and they've got these amazing, you know, Australia, the turf sprinters have got an amazing turn of foot. Um, but they can't sustain it for a long period of time. So, um, you know, that's, but that's their style of racing also in Australia. They get out, they walk a bit and then they sprint. Um, uh, you know, I've got a lot of. That's probably one of the problems I have with my my breeze up horses. Is I, I get I tend to go for a short tibia and a long hind cannon, and they and they um, they can't sustain it for they can, they they're terrific with breeze up sales. They go very quick at the breeze up sales, but they you know when they get to actual races over five, six, seven furlongs, they can't sustain it. But you um, you know when you get it right, um, as I say with like Malabath and those sorts of horses where you where where we get it right. Um, we turn out with a very good horse. Yeah, and I like. I think it's so interesting. Like, I'm, you're a great follow on Twitter, Byron. You know, at Performance Genetics for um, for everyone. And like, I always I enjoy your tweets sometimes when you show every horse you bought that calendar year, and it's the you can see the uh, consistency in type over that period. And I'm, I think it was the one anomaly one year was Ali's sister. No, did I get that right? Well, I did, did you buy Ali's sister? Or it was a it was a sit. It was sentimental. Got into the uh, um, got into the model. I forget it was. I, don't, I didn't buy Ali's sister. And the guy ended up keeping her back um, because the mare had died. Um, there was a man, there was a horse there that um, no. Okay. Uh, it was a sentimental reason at the time. Anyway, I remember. So, uh, you, you uh, so, so and, that, and then Jake, that's the that's the um, that's the problem with. You know, we've got all this data and, and, and it, what are coming down to, Jack, is the problems I've got is trusting the data. Like, uh, you know, Matt gets at me all the time. We go back, like every year we'll go back before we start buying horses. I'll meet Matt. I do the phasing July sale here, but I'll, I'll meet Matt at, at, at Arcana. We sit down at the, at the little cafe just out the, at Arcana and we, and we talk for, you know, we don't, we have to, we chat every week, but, um, we will sit down and have a chat and talk about, where we've gone wrong in the past and what we need to be doing better. And, and, you know, it's a constant feedback type of thing. And when we talk, and Diego will, you know, is now a big part of that as well. He comes over and we sit down and we talk about what did we do last year and what can we do better? Um, 
And we go over those things. And, and one of the problems that we've identified is that we are, you know, we get back to looking, if you look at those those graphs I showed you and we sort of A plus A's and B's and B pluses and B, we'll, we'll take horses that are B plus rated horses because we like the pedigree or we like the, you know, we like, we think, oh, we can make money out of this horse or, or this horse is a nice, and it's a nice, but we're kicking against the probability. Like the B plus horses are basically, you know, a, a, a sort of one in 10 shot of being a good horse. Well, 50-50, yeah, exactly. So, so we, but we take a lot of B plus horses and, and Matt goes, look, we took this horse here as a B plus. This horse. These all, all these horses were slow and they were the, they were the nine out of 10 that were slow. They weren't the one out of 10. So that's where, you know, and, 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 you know, because we've been res- like restricted because we haven't gone to as many sales as, as we should do. And this is what we want to get towards is just going through all the sales and, and not treating the first horse at Phasic Tipton in October and the last horse at, at, at Tattersalls in December as the same horse and just trying to sort of say, okay, just be consistent across the whole bunch. Um, but building the tools. And that's the other thing, which has been the big change for us is that Vertex AI system, which I just showed you hasn't, they only built that in, June or July of 2021. So that's only been a, you know, a year and a half or so that that's been available to be used. Um, before that, we were patching together a whole lot of different systems and, it, and it's not really, um, you know, not, none of it was sort of an overview like we have now where we can sort of say, okay, let's take a video of a horse and watch it walk and get, get a good representation of the horse. Um, and let the data sort of drive the, the, the decision making. Um, and as I say, once we've got this this latest model, this confirmation model, we've got that into into working. Um, one of the things I do know is that with all this data, it's easy to confuse one model. Like you could sort of say, as we sort of say, if if I get an A plus rated horse, I'm still probably a fifty fifty chance he's no good. Like there's still, but if if I've got two models that are working on independent data sets, if I've got the walk and I've got the horse how it stands up, and they both say yes, this is a good horse. It's pretty hard to get both of them wrong, um, and I, I sort of look at it like, um, you know, a friend of mine uh, in Australia, a guy Matt, he just sold his business. Actually, he was a radiologist, and he had, um, uh, you know, he had this large radiology business. And he said to me, I, I explained what we were doing, and I showed him what we were doing. He's, he owns racehorses in Australia, and he said this is exactly what happened in the radiology business. I said, what do you mean? He said, he said, well. 15 years ago, he said in radiology, when I, he said when I was going into it, he said, I was looking at a 1,000 X-ray images a day. He said, I'd just look at thousands and thousands of X-ray images a day. He said, just to, and he said, and I'd be trying to identify things. Artificial intelligence, he said, image recognition came into the business about six years ago. And he said, we've sold our business on the basis of the fact that our artificial intelligence system has been self-learning for the last year and a half. He said, we've sold it for a lot of money. He said, what it's allowed me to do is instead of looking at um, having to look at a thousand X-rays a day, he said I can feed it into the into the image recognition program. It can look at a thousand X-rays in one hour. In and, and he said, and then but what it does is it identifies the twenty that I really need to concentrate on, and that's sort of what we're getting towards. What we're trying to get towards here is it's not going to get every horse right. It's not going to be able to classify every horse. But if it turns around and says to you, Byron, here's um, the uh, like his Tattersall's book one, do the whole book, and it turn, we turn around and say, look, we know there's a thousand horses here. There's only going to be really fifty that you want, and probably thirty that you really want. The other nine hundred and seventy you don't want. Um, here's a list of ten or twelve. Now we know you're going to miss some of these good horses because there's thirty good ones, and I've only given you a list of ten. But of those ten. You know, your, your strike rate's going to be, you know, 70% or something like that. And that's where... Yeah. And I think we need to take a step back and take how extraordinary that is. You, you could get to a point in the not-too-distant future where Byron is sitting at home in Lexington, Kentucky, um, and he is uh, asked for his view as an agent to, produce, to select yearlings for them, and yeah. you are paid on the basis of your model, of Byron's model, not on the basis of Byron physically being there, which in a tech world is infinitely scalable. And it's something incredibly exciting that could be, we are on the preface. Yeah, like I don't think it'll ever get away from, um, you know, I, I think 
Well, I think it would get, like, it's application, yes. It's application of it if you, if you sort of sort of turn around and say, this is how we're going to apply it. And, 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 it, and it applies in, as I say, it's an imperfect model. It won't get every horse right. So, so that's where it's unlike, say, the x-rays with, with radiology, you have to get every, everything right. Because if you, if you say, no, this is, this x-ray is fine and someone has a cancer, they die. It's sort of like, not like that. This is, this is, um, you're allowed to have, um, false negatives in, in the thoroughbred game because, at the end of the day, if we're only taking, you know, 10 shots on, you know, we're only buying 10 yearlings a year, we just want to stuff those 10 yearlings as many good horses in that 10 as possible. Um, and that's what this comes down to, is this comes down to a really good way of shortlisting and guiding you towards the highest probability. And that's where we want to head. Are we just sort of, you know, racing horses has got increasingly more expensive. Um and you know, putting them into trainings hard, like you could, you know, or, and, and doing what we do, breeze ups is hard. Like the bullets, the, as, as we talked about at the start, the bullseye now at the breeze ups has got so small, um, it's really, really hard to hit it. And so, guys, the, the guys that are doing the breeze ups now are starting to sort of look at all of that, this sort of stuff. Um, you've got various other people that, like, I'm not, I'm not the only one doing this. Like, if you go to, I, I was, I was in Australia. Um, I've been there, yeah. down there twice in the last six months. Um, there's two or three, there's two two groups I know of down there in Australia that are doing almost the exact same thing I'm doing. Um, there's a group of guys in Europe that are doing it. There's um, two other groups here in America that are doing it. So I'm not Robinson Crusoe. I'm not by myself here, but. Uh... <laughs> you are a father. So, you know, let's, let's get terms correct. Byron, so we've done our, like, I will always buy a horse at the Breeze Up. We've done it our own journey. So I remember I bought a horse at the, um, Guinea's breeze up before it had the, the biggest stride length in the whole um the whole complex and clocked pretty well. He's now a very talented polo yes. pony. Uh, but last year uh, we bought a filly, the only filly we bought in the whole breeze up season, and we knew a, a factor that no model is going to take account of, which is yeah. um she got kicked before a breeze. Very practical thing, and she wasn't able to do yeah. exactly. She still clocked pretty well, thirty sixth, and she was a Glen Eagle, so you know there was a play. She was out of a Winker Watson mare, which made me um. Still gives me shakes, but she turned into a you know a multiple six figure profit for our syndicate, which is a wonderful result, right? How can we do it again this year? What is your little bits of advice for people not watching this, trying to navigate the breeze ups, want to get involved? Apart from buying <laughs> the Star Bloodstock, see the Stars Colt or uh, a Star Bloodstock horse, full stop. What is your last kind of parting kernel of advice you'd give people to make it pay at the breeze ups? Because Two hundred and ten thousand might seem like a lot of money, but my God, I'd love oh, to give oh, you two hundred and ten thousand. Yeah. yeah I, so, so what is your what's your kind of advice for people um, going on that journey? Look, time time counts to a certain point. Time counts. It's not necessarily how fast the horse went; it's how he went fast. That's so. If I was looking at breeze up horses right today, and I, I, I and you know you you would sort of you know your group or whoever it was, you're definitely going to be struggling if you do not have the times. But if you get the times, don't like be absolutely binary about it. Don't just say I'm only going to look at the top X amount in the, the times. Broaden out the the times because as you say, you know. Um, if the, the you know we've had horses we had like stakes winners like Lady Penelope was like the thirty fifth fastest or something like that like we we get you know she was a she was a listed winning horse for for Joseph O'Brien we get horses that don't go in the top ten percent and still turn out to be good horses and the breeze up guys it happens all the time so I would say get the times because you're gonna you know that's a you know at a base level time does count um, but then look at how um, you know, consistent in that gallop, if that horse did the time, let's say you take the top, say, 20% or 30% of times, and you look at each horse, watch their videos, and look at how consistently those horses are, are moving across the ground from the start to the middle to the end. Take out horses that have gone, that you look at, and you just say they're, they're not, they're struggling at the end, they're, they're, or they're not, um, how they started off is not the same as how they finished, because that's what you're ultimately looking at. You're looking for is a horse that can sustain a level of speed for a long period of time. They're the good horses, they're, they're, you know, and, and every one of them, like Eldar, El Rob, and and and, uh, and Brad Sell, and and um, they're, they're, that's what they did at the sales. They they didn't. It wasn't you know Malabath did the same thing. You know, you go and talk to them. They, they 
Hey, the good horse can sustain, not just have a high speed, uh, which means that they got a, a, a fast time at the breeze up sales, but they sustain that. They can sustain it for a long period of time. So you've just rocked my world, Byron, because uh, I have thought the game of horse racing was about going faster, but today I've learned that it's just about going the same speed. And if you do that, you're... Uh, it's be fast in the first place, but... Uh, so... <laughs> Byron, thank you so much. What an insightful chat. Um, again, I'd like to uh, remind people, follow Byron on Twitter, give him a follow, interact with him. He's always so generous with his time and... and much like uh right now thank you very much byron and uh no problem jack keep well there you have it the gospel according to the godfather how generous was byron with his time how insightful was that discussion delving deep into the data of what informs the decisions of the judges at star bloodstock thank you so much to byron i hope wish and want to wish the whole team best of luck with that uh the whole breeze up season. I'm looking forward to having a look at that Cedar Stars Colt and seeing does he measure up to Byron's assessment in my own mind. I'm sure he may be an A plus racehorse when he does hit the track. Thank you to all of you for uh, watching along. If you haven't already, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. We're going to be delving further into the essential question. Our machine's about to take over. I have a prediction. It might be quicker than you think. Until next time, thanks very much.